mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no doubt that Jerusalem is one of the world's top tourist destinations. I have to admit many times about Jerusalem, I wonder what people are thinking. I say this because there's a demonstrated phenomenon called Jerusalem syndrome. In this, a previously perfectly well-adjusted person comes to the city and starts sightseeing and seeing the sights described in the Bible. Then they start having delusions of grandeur. They they know to go back to the hotel room, take sheets and uh, towels and arrange them in rows. Then they wander in the city, claim to be a prophet chosen by God. And the people need to repent before it's too late. And they completely disassociate with who they were before they came. It's been known to happen. Rare, but it's documented. Luckily for those affected, the syndrome clears up right after they leave the city. It happens. But of course, that's not the only thing you wonder when people are thinking in Jerusalem. Because once I saw a photo of a tour group. They were touring and had their picture taken in front of the Dome of the Rock. Then they digitally altered the photo to remove the Dome of the Rock and put a replica of the temple there. I find that rather petty and pointless, for Jesus said of that very same temple, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days, referring to his own bodily resurrection. So yeah, I guess you could say Jerusalem brings out the out of these people, and you're wondering what's on their minds. But one person, you don't have to worry about their thoughts towards Jerusalem, are Jesus Christ himself, who says what he thinks of the city in today's Gospel from Luke. For verse 31, the Pharisees tell him, Jesus, Herod's gunning for you. Flee for your life. Jesus, flee. Jesus says, Herod is no threat. Because he's not immediately in the city of Jerusalem. His words are, surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. In other words, the people of God and the worldview are so reprobate that it's apparently guaranteed that a prophet cannot die outside the holy city. Rather, they go to Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of David, to be martyred. Jesus rightly breaks this up, because it's the Pharisees who are telling him this. Ironically, it's the Pharisees who conspire to have him killed. <laughs> also, there's an irony that Jesus going to Jerusalem, he's not just a prophet. He's the boss of the prophets. He's God incarnate. But when he enters Jerusalem, his fate will be the same as his servants. He won't even last a week. He'll be dead in five days. So how does Jesus respond to this? The very people that should have recognized him as God, as Messiah, were the ones who conspired to kill him. Is Jesus, is he vindictive? Does he show that he wants revenge? No. He's sorrowful. He says in verse 34, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have loved to gather your children together as a hen gathers and chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. Since day one, God always intended to have his people succeed. I mean, from Moses to Jesus, that was a 1,400 year gap. And God always wanted to be his nation of Israel to be a light to the nations. For ambassadors from other countries to come and learn the ways of God and make God known to the world. But in 1,400 years, this plan never got off the ground. The closest thing they had to success was David and Solomon, who for 80 years, they kind of did it. They screwed up, but overall it was going well. So there's something more restful. But for the other 1,320 years, it was a profound failure. People never could obey God. God said in the very first commandment, I am God, who have no other gods. I alone will you worship. And people were like, okay, we can do that. Then they got anxiety about, will we survive? Will we have a good harvest? Will we win in battle? It's our survival, so you know what? To survive. We'll hedge our bets. Well, these other guys we pray to on, on the side. And so the people failed in this regard. But not just in idolatry. For God wanted a nation.
nation defined by ethical conduct. No murders, no adultery, no theft or lying. And oh yes, a country where people honor their uh, parents and their elders. And also a country that looked after the widows, the poor, and the downtrodden. God won all of this. And the people of God, just like politicians running for office, said, hey God, it's no problem, we got this. Though a time came to actually do this, to not kill, to not commit adultery, to not lie, to honor your parents, to take care of the widows and the poor, when the politician in office, the people dropped the ball and failed to deliver. And, you know, it's not like God uh, just let it be. He sent prophets repeatedly to warn the people to get them back on track. And the prophets were always, of course, ignored. And so finally, God enters the world of the person of Jesus Christ to direct this personally. And how does Jesus, again, address the people who failed all over and over again? We see Jesus has no desire for revenge, rather he's sorrowful saying he had longed to gather the people together. And he says in verse 35, Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And these words of Jesus are not idle, but they're prophetic. For 37 years after he died and after he returned to life, the Roman Empire descended upon Jerusalem and completely annihilated the city. The temple, gone. The priests, killed. And the band of survivors of the initial attack fled to a desert outpost called the Masada, figuring they would just simply outweigh the Roman legions. They got food, they got water. It's a one-way outpost, one-way in or out, uh, open wide space to pick off anyone coming. They figured they were safe. Well, no one defies Rome and lives. And for a few years they held out, confident that no one was getting through. Until they realized, to their horror, what the Romans had been doing. They had been building a ramp to the entrance. So that way in or out. And now they're surrounded. And they had to come to the bleak reality that there was no way out. No one was leaving the Masada alive. No one did. They didn't realize they had a choice, mass suicide or mass crucifixion. They chose the suicide. That's awful. But this makes the point with a sledgehammer, that when Jesus Christ shows up, the old way of doing things is gone, and the new way is here. Jesus Christ renews all things and makes all things simpler. For example, when Moses walked out from Sinai, he had 613 commandments for the people of God to obey. 613, I hope you have a really good memory. <laughs> but Jesus took this and simplified it down to two. One, love God with all your soul, heart, mind, and strength. Two, love your neighbor as yourself. So with things so much, more, so much simpler, we should be doing better than our Old Testament counterparts, right? Sadly, we have failed just as profoundly and frequently. Just as people came up with excuses to go and worship other gods, as flimsy as those excuses might be, we're no better. God commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Yet we also have these same flimsy excuses for those people just are not lovable, so we can't love them. Meanwhile, in the people of the Old Testament, our proximity to Scripture gets us cocky. We start to see God as this magical thing we have at our disposal, and we're content to put him in our pocket and ignore, the, ignore God until we need spiritual help. Hardly, like, it's hardly an act of love. But when God, just like his Old Testament people, sends warnings to us. The words of the prophet, prophets have been recorded in Scripture. Likewise, Jesus spoke warnings in the Gospels. The apostles wrote letters of warning. These things have all been preserved in Scripture for us, the people of God. But upon repeated hearing every Sunday, we become callous towards them, and they become just another part of our lives. And so, just like the people of the Old Testament, who were confident the temple was good enough, we can, we can become arrogant in our church building as well. We'd almost come to see God as he's this puppy we're training for teaching him to heal, saying, well, God, I know the right thing to say.
say in the Bible, I said the right words in prayer, God. So now you have to do what I say. That's not reality. Trust me. But Jesus came as a warning for the people of Jerusalem. Don't keep going in this mindset. Repent and turn back. And sadly, most people in Jerusalem told Jesus, Jesus to take a hike. Long term, the fate of Jerusalem was sealed. And we look at the fate of Jerusalem, and it's horrifying. But of course, there were a few people there who did listen to Jesus. They acknowledged him as Messiah and repented. And likewise, they were called Jesus' warnings in other areas of scripture about the fate of Jerusalem. So when they saw the Roman Empire closing in, they did the smart thing. And they fled from their lives, and they survived, and were spared, spared the horror of Jerusalem and the Messiah. So the people repented. Not only was their eternal life secure, their life here in the present was also secure. But that begs the question. If that happened to the city of Jerusalem, because they ignored the warnings of Jesus Christ, what will happen to people in the present who ignore his warning? That's terrifying. I mean, I mean, people ask me as a pastor all the time, what will happen to the United States of America if it doesn't repent and keeps going this way? I have no idea. I don't want to know. I saw Mad Max. I don't want that to happen to anyone. <laughs> no, I mean, that's more thought. And I just, all I can say is repent. Repent. I cannot be dogmatic where the Bible is dogmatic. I can't read the book of Revelation and say, well, this is going to happen, or that's going to happen, and so on. All I can say is that God is incredibly merciful, and when you repent, he forgives. And there's also a silver lining. When Jesus speaks these words in Jerusalem, we see he's not some Rambo dishing out vigilante justice to people who deserve it. We see a God, a Jesus Christ, who's merciful to people. He wants reconciliation. He even closes the text today with the words, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This references the triumphal entry, where he is rightfully called the Messiah. The Messiah, who for people who don't deserve it, would willingly be arrested, betrayed, who would willingly be flogged and beat to a pulp and all messed up, who would willingly be stripped nude and hang for a cross for six hours until he finally suffocates to death. Jesus Christ did all these things for people who did not deserve it. Because he wanted to love them. Well, because he loved them. Because he wanted to forgive them. And this was the mechanism by which he, people would be forgiven. He endured all that. All that flogging, all the crucifixion, all the horror. Death itself. Forgive people who don't deserve it. And give them another chance. That's the counterbalance. Yes, God is active in this world and God does things to contain sin. And sin has consequences. I'll pull no punches and say that's not true because it is. But on the other hand, to balance that out, we do have a God of love. A God who willingly died by crucifixion to forgive people who don't deserve it. To give them a second chance upon their repentance. So let's focus on the positive. That as long as we're alive in this life, as long as our, our body draws breath, we have hope. We have a God of love. That upon our repentance will be forgiven. And our eternal life will be secure. And our life in this world will be better off. Because trust me, when you want to go through life being a hard-headed person that no one needs to tell anything to, you're going to go through life able to take a criticism the answer there is obvious. So the good news is, is that today can be the day that we repent and forget a new or new life in Jesus Christ. That's good to know. But part of that new life in Jesus Christ is forgiving as Jesus Christ is forgiven. And this truly is the hardest part. We don't really have to go through the major stuff. People do really terrible things. We'll start small with people that are just so annoying. Be that boss at work or that coworker, or that person on the street that just looks at you, that look that says something very snide, you want to go, yeah, you know what? And respond in kind. But remember, God loves that person too. Christ also died on the cross for that person. 
And uh, if repentant, God brings them forgiveness too. So since we've also been forgiven and made alive in Jesus Christ, do our best. Don't hold against you. You're forgiven. I know it's not easy, but ask believers who have repented. Ask people who have new life. That's part of our mission here. So let me conclude with this. Life can be very scary. But as scary as it gets, in Jesus Christ, because this is the day we're repented. This is the day we have new life. Whatever comes down the line, we're confident in Him. And in Him, we do our best to forgive others as well.